Greetings, everybody. Welcome to another edition of Guerrilla Intellectual University here at Black Power Media. I'm Jared Ball. Happy to be joined by Kalanji Jamachanga and, of course, Dr. Joy James. Greetings, everybody. Good morning. How you all doing? Hey, man. Well, Episode thanks. six. So six. So just real quick, a little bit of housekeeping, just just uh, just to clarify any confusion that folks might have, as uh, we described in the description of the show. This time we're going to uh, uh, to encourage a little bit of focus and attention to the panel and our guests. We've disabled the chat. Um, please find no disrespect in that, and we encourage you to participate via the email address in the show description. Uh, G intellectual you at gmail.com and if you would just send uh your comments questions for the our guests and panel to that address we will respond uh and get to as many as we can uh but just a little just to clarify <clears throat> excuse me that that's what's going on uh for this edition of gorilla intellectual university uh so before we move any farther anything either of you want to add or clarify or or before we move on and, and bring our guests on just that it's a, a beautiful day for a revolution um you know we want to uh salute uh bob marley today on his born date you know i know that uh a good good uh comrade dr jared ball has one of our favorite freedom fighters and comrades behind him today mumia abu jamal there's an excellent interview that we'll be posting uh tweeting out today on um that Mumia actually did with uh, Bob Marley, uh, November of 79, I believe it was. So, you know, it speaks to, uh, you know, the, the the work. So definitely shout out. We remember Bob Marley for his cultural, um, his cultural work. Right on, right on. And definitely please, if you haven't, check out the interview we did with uh, Lynn Washington and uh, Jr. and Todd Stephen Burroughs yesterday with some updates on Mumia and the comparison between him and uh, uh, Tyree Nichols. So anyway, um, all right, well, without further ado, let's go ahead and get to our guest then. We have a very special guest this morning, uh, Felicia Denau, who is among many other things, an assistant professor of Africana studies at the University of Cincinnati. She writes in the words of Sylvia Winter, towards the end of empire, war, and accumulation by elimination. That is very dope. Welcome, Felicia, to Gorilla Intellectual University. Thank you for having me. Thank you for having this program, honestly. Right on. So uh, I know there's a lot we wanted to get to. You have, uh, um, again, you have your own uh, work coming out and out, uh, and you are also a contributor to this new book that uh, we're going to talk I know, a little bit about this morning that you're going to be in conversation this morning about uh, um, In Pursuit of Revolutionary Love by Dr. Joy James. And in your chapter, The Plurality of Abolitionism, uh, you and Devin Springer have a very fascinating conversation with, with, with Professor James. So uh, with that little bit of a preamble, I will fall back and let you all get started and uh, look very much forward to it. Well, yeah, thanks. I look forward to the collective round as well. I mean, so I was like, oh, well, I want to know or tell people how I met Felicia. So Felicia is an amazing organizer, and I met them when they were a graduate student at Brown University. And they organized both on campus, and they are also organized in the community. And so the architects of abolitionism, like if you see anything online that's at all related or useful, a lot of that was driven by uh, Felicia. Can, I can call you Felicia, right? That or Dr. Felicia, yeah. a lot of that was driven um, by Felicia's work and their organizing with grad students. So again, my, I mean, I'm always informed, and you all always kind of push me to think more critically and and get up and do more. You know, even when I'm cranky. So thank you for all your intellectual and political contributions. Thank you, and I guess I'll add that um, that Carswell State Reading Group, which is how Joy and I connected originally, was stewarded by like a colleague of mine, Kristen May, um, and took on a life of its own in Rhode Island. And basically we met with formerly incarcerated um, people, organizers, students, just community members, um, 
and joy contributed was just such a fundamental part of the analysis we were trying to build out of Rhode Island, which is a small state, but over incarcerated, like, you know, all the others. Um, and she was integral to giving us this language of, of war and captivity. And so my own, I had been working on my dissertation at the time that I met Joy um, on this idea of unnameable war. I feel like it, in a lot of black historical monographs, political theory, there's like this, this attrition that happens when you're trying to name or categorize um, ideologically the kind of violence we experience. And it, it always hesitates to name war. And war becomes, a, you know, if, if Black people claim the status of warfare, we're trivializing the status. If we claim the status of genocide, we're trivializing the status of genocide. And so this kind of conceptual attrition really fascinated me um, and set me off to kind of pursue this idea of unnameable war. Like, what kind of war power are we subject to? Um, and joy, I feel like there's critical military studies, but we don't even exist, you know, solely mm. on that front. So I'm like, critical war studies is this thing that I'm trying to push my work towards. And I would consider Joy like an architect of that branch. I think there are a lot of people that are there, but you do get told that you're exaggerating or don't make a metaphor out of war as you write in the, vol in the, in the uh, collection of essays. And, you know, this kind of hesitance or this skepticism or this, you know, you're inflating you know, there's a lack of precision or you're playing into right wing talking points. And when it's, it's nothing but a status of war, slavery is a condition of war, penal captivity is a condition of war, where our greatest sort of rebellions, the Haitian revolution, the civil war, you know, it's war up and down all the way through, but what kind of war power is what I'm after? And what are the dangers in allowing that war capacity to replicate? Um, that's and that's why I love Joy's like processual language. So you talk about leverage, fractionation. There's this movement to it, and I'm really concerned, alarmed by when this thing like has a viral capacity. It, the the war power of last century is not the war power of this century. What we are encountering is uh, it's the way it can shape shift, as you say, Joy. Um, it relies on our capacity to rebel. It, it actually stabilizes, as Joy says, through our capacity to rebel, it learns. Like if there's an algorithmic nature to how we're allowed to resist, algorithms, the prior step is data to collect. Before you can actually have a proficient algorithm, you need data and we are that data. So the datification of our rebellion, all of this fascinates me. And so like my dissertation culminates on, in a chapter about the atomic bomb and how all the uranium was sourced from Katanga in the Congo. And there was a shadow war basically fought in the Congo between the Nazi regime and the United States over this uranium because it was the most enriched uranium on the planet at that time. And now there are like multiple sources, Canada, Navajo Nation. But this was the determining theater um, for developing that kind of weaponry and that kind of capacity. And so I, I tie it to kind of all of the legal regimes that go into managing the Congo. And what fascinates me is that the war power we're subject to, it bounces between a state power and a master power, which to me is like the private right to violence. The Congo, we all know is like a private holding of Leopold, but there's this wonderful book called Rogue Empires that looks into all the legal loopholes that Europe had to allow to create a privatized state, which is very different than a corporate state and the author makes this kind of claim. But so what I'm tracing is this, the war power that we um, that we live through is about that shuffling of coercive capacity between the private realm and the public. And so I'm trying to throw up some flags about how the state needs masters. And if we are going to pursue a revolutionary state, we have to leave behind that imprint that the Western state brings with it, which is always it needs a kind of master power to outsource things it cannot do, to reclaim when master power has been sufficiently like produced. Um, and so I, I don't know, that's kind of the dissertation is wide, it crawls through time and, and space. But ultimately, what I'm interested in is how do we 
continue to situate ourselves in a conversation about war? What does that open up in terms of international solidarities, in terms of international claims we can make? And how does it kind of awaken people um, to the ideological construction of violence? Because even when we ourselves say, oh, this is domestic war, why are we qualifying it with the domestic? Why are we giving war, like war is the conceptual property of the interstate system. And when we qualify things as domestic, we're saying, oh, that's right, war belongs to states. But war happens in states. So I, I want to kind of, unnameable war is my capacious way of looking at all of the diaspora to think about how private and public violence use offload on one another um, to produce a capacity for war. So it's not just like, you know, we're in a condition of war and like, although you could say that, um, but it's this condition that we're in builds a war capacity for the West. Western fundamentalism relies on the capacity we endow it to practice war. And so, but it's very, it's unique in the sense that it needs that master power. Like the master figure is something I cannot leave behind. There, there's no way that it doesn't have an afterlife. And so I'm trying to figure out, like, how does the master live on beyond the figure? So this is where joy comes in again as a function. What is that function? And what does, how does it allow um, moments of instability to be stabilized, like coming out of the Civil War, the progressive era, the post-civil rights era? There's always this interesting, like, in, I, I call it a like a, pro, a generative struggle between master and state. That to me is like the secret war power, the suppressed, the subterranean war power that we are actually dealing with. Um, so I went off on a tangent, but that's to say Joy, I think is this, when I told her about the project, she was like, we need this. And that's the first time I got that response. Um, and as to, yeah, sorry, go ahead. <laughs> right, no, it's just great because it's, it's not only, because we were talking on the phone for hours after I met you, right? Uh, you know, you're in Providence, you know, I'm, I'm in the city. Of course, there's only one city. Um, so in airbrushing revolution for the sake of abolition, the last section is called war is not a metaphor. And that language came out of discussions with you and your collective crew. So, I mean, this is the way I see it. I, I can't claim any form of thought because it's all collective thinking, yeah. right? And so, because we were on the phone for hours and I was like, and then when I get off, you know, and you know, and I'll say other people too. So not, not like, there's no implication of you in anything that I do, right? That other people find problematic, but it was this critique that was coming from so-called students who were intellectuals, but within the academy, right? As we know, all, everybody on this platform has taught in, in different forms of schools. There's this hierarchy and there's this disciplinary, you know, procedure that students are the recipients of knowledge, not the producers of knowledge. And so often we miss the collaboration, right? among ourselves. But so, yeah, I wanna thank you because, and also this is what the book is about. Like, I'm just gonna hold it up. Um, we're crowdsourcing soon so we can get it into um, different incarcerated zones, uh, women's prisons, um, also where um, men and non-binary people are housed as well. So the war, is something, I mean, you say it's unnameable, but also I'm wondering if it's unspeakable, like you're disciplined not to talk about it. And I think this is where my critique of conventional academics um, who are liberal or radical liberals or whatever, however they, they wouldn't identify as such, right? But the being disciplined as if we were also students, like we're pre-K, K, whatever, to not to talk about what goes down in the quote household. Like the, you know, the democracy in the state and society socialize you, I believe, into belonging as if they're gonna give you protections while they're actually predatory. So you start, or you mentioned Leopold, right? So to go back, I mean, 
Belgium, and it's a private ownership of the Congo, which is rare. So it's a different form of colonialism. But the level of terror is off the hook because the master gets to, I mean, what they do with mass rape, mass torture. I mean, when the state does that as a visible flex of power, it makes you realize the state is fascist. And so most states have to pretend that they have coherence and they're not just terror regimes. But for Leopold, if you did not pick your quota of, of you know, tobacco, rubber, whatever he's selling, you know, right, he, he would have your hand chopped off. It's so freaking irrational. So after you chop off my right hand, you think I'm going to pick more? This is not about production. It's not even about stable political economies like exploitation of labor. And it sort of goes beyond the standard exploitation of slave because now you just maimed and tortured the slave. And so they have less productivity or maybe they'll be dead, you know, within 48 hours because they bleed out or infection. And so I'm wondering, I mean, I'm wondering if our struggle and maybe this is the impact that the AP folks are having on me. I'm wondering if our struggle is so embedded in our psyches, right? that we don't want to describe it as a war because we actually know what war looks like. And so we have to pretend that it's a political regime. And that's different from a battlefield. Hmm. Yeah, I mean, I feel like war formalizes, um, it creates fronts, it does all of that ideological acceleration that is frightening. I was frightened writing. <laughs> yeah. um, that's how alienated you are from the, from touching the experience sometimes, like you said, embedded in your psyche. Because uh, you know, you know, M. Mesa there says to think dangerously uh, or to think clearly is to think dangerously. And that's exactly what I felt. You feel when you're starting to veer into that dangerous sort of zone and when the overwhelming reality of how violence is organized in a raid against you becomes clear and that's what unnameable war did to me but also like the master state complex because i mean the privatization of violence is accelerating right now the war actually comes from the private domain. It's when you start raising standing armies that it becomes like the property of the state. And so it has this, this it's rooted in a kind of private affair in the ancient regime kind of warfare. Um, but between what's happening in Minnesota with kind of private patrols, um, the Wagner group, uh, Blackwater who renamed themselves. Mm -hmm. I mean, what I wanna do is anticipate the next stage and what this, the master state conflict uh, complex does is however terrifying, it gives me a name or a capacity to track how this mutates. That's what I'm really, I'm, I'm interested in like the, the intra community work. And I think what your piece does so well is that there's this, there's this spiritual component that allows you to enter the fear um, there's this buoyancy in your writing. There is this this kind of not to say you're pure, but there is this this, this purity of spirit I almost feel that braces you to, to face it. And what I want to do in in similar ways, I draw from literature and film and song and all of and I, that's why I love how you open. Um, is be able to forecast a little bit uh, and to be able to stop being on the back foot. And when I started seeing how the master state complex, it's sort of reproductive capacity. For example, there were interesting arguments made at the turn of the 20th century that slave owners actually took over the what was supposed to be a state mandated regulation of the slave trade. So when the transatlantic slave trade was banned, slave owners did a favor and bailed out the state. And this should be recognized and how like prison and convict leasing and how all of that's going to be played out. And so this is made, this argument is made by like a, I don't know, a Senator at the um, uh, Southern Sociological Association in like 1911. And I was like, that's it. 
that's what the unnameable war is. It's this, it's, it's not just a matter, like right now we're very concerned in terms of like neoliberal structuring with the privatization of things, but it's also the way publics are made on the backs of black people, but it's not just publics, it's also privates. And so it's that interdependence that I want to trace. And so my question is like, when I was talking to community organizers in Rhode Island, they were like, okay, we understand the abolition thing, but what happens when then this entire police force is privatized? Like, what are you going to tell us? What are you going to do? We know that that's the, that that's the dimension, right? But, but that's kind of key, right? Because in the struggles, it, it looks like it's a struggle against the state, but it, I believe it is what you, it's a, it's a two-headed hydra. I mean, a hydra had more than one head, so it's probably multiple, but you can't just deal with the state without understanding the privatization of terror and accumulation. And I'm, you know, this is our previous conversation. Is this, you know, about oligarchs and corporations yeah. running it? Or is it, you know, about the state? Like, what is the state as an autonomous being from now? It used to be millionaires. Now it's a billionaire class that runs it. But even as you were saying about um, Blackwater, I believe we understudy the mercenaries, like yeah. Eric Prince, who's what the brother of Betsy DeVos, DeVos. Who's the, like the Department of Education under Trump, which means, you know, they're eviscerating anything that could possibly look like, you know, sovereign, you know, we don't have sovereign rights, but the right to have sovereign rights, like not to try to be snarky. Um, in terms of black people, indigenous people of color, working class, you know, queer, um, Marxist, like, it's just, we're going to disappear you conceptually through indoctrination and education. But what's your brother doing? Like, okay, I have to keep one eye on what you're doing, right? And also the rights of not to be, at least, you know, have more protections against sexual violence or rape on campus and other places. But your brother's, you know, former Navy SEAL, if I recall correctly, I mean, he's got a multi-billion dollar gig recruiting from the military. So the state wars train what will be private employees who will work for mercenaries. Right. And that revenue stream has never diminished. There's always, as you put, there's a coexistence of the two, right? And sometimes they clash. That's what's yeah. interesting. That's what the civil war is. It's a competition over federal power. It's not a competition over like, I want to do this here and you can do that there and states, right? It's actually an all out assault for federal capacity to remake the contract between master and state. And so the Haitian revolution has a similar thing where you divide the metropole and you divide the colonial elite. You know, you, you exploit those divisions. So when we are really in our bag, so to speak, <laughs> in terms of strategy and rebellion, we are always splintering the master state function. And I take function from you and I wanted to pose that question to you. Like you were so insistent that captive maternal is not an identity, it's a function. Um, and then you, like you said, you're attuned to fractionation. That's like another word you use to describe sort of people that could conform to an elite caste, but instead break it apart, initiate new kinds of cadres like Ida B. Wells is your kind of, you know, favorite ancestor, as you say. Um, so it, it, it often comes to a point or like, let's look at Leopold. He was so bad that the, and the European community realized that there was these legal yeah, was runaways, right? Like this idea of private sovereignty. Again, it's not a private corporation. You know, it's not like a privately held state, it's private sovereignty. And there's this just fascinating legal thing that this guy does to track this phenomenon. And basically what he says, they use this to settle Africa. And the settlement of Africa, to me, is like the biggest demographic like movement. It is parallel to the, the slave trade, the, the, just the white like settlement of Africa. The way it happens, the numbers, the massification, it's incredible. I think it's something we disappear from our imagination, that they were able to settle so effectively so quickly. And it was through some of these legal things. Like, how does Europe rationalize to itself these processes? But... The, the, the thing that I'm interested in is how do you, Leopold so bad that Europe says, we need to make this a public colony. Yeah, but as a Belgian Congo. 
Leo Paul's so bad that Mark Twain has to write an op-ed on him. Right. And it's just like, because he's like off the hook, but this is the Berlin Conference, right? They're cartographers. They sit down and they redraw the map of the world, meaning the Africa, and they just carve it up. I'll take this part of the, you know, like it's it's past the level of a real estate developer. Right. I, I see it as it's a, you're right. Like what happens to us when we're trafficked on this shores, you know, massive genocide and in and, and, and a world war actually in some ways, right? Yeah. But when they have that conference, whereas in Berlin, I don't know where they were meeting, but when they have that conference and they're, we're going to carve up Africa and Leopold's like, I'm going to take this. Set. That's another form of, of terror. So even their bureaucracy, right, and their reshaping of the world is, is all expression of warfare. But I want to go back to what you said about the spirituality that we have, right? So, right. So the book opens with uh, a discussion of Oshun, right? The, I don't know how well people know the Orishas, Alegwa. I mean, we, we could go to the list, right? Yemaya, Oshun, Obatala, Eshu. But it's about Oshun, and this is what I was listening to our culture, right? Someone was doing a narrative about how Oshun petitions Olo Dumare, which is the head spirit because the waters have dried up on earth. And the reason Olodumare allowed um, the deserts to spread is because the other Orisha were gonna pull a, a coup on, on them. And they're like, and they wanted a shoe to join in this rebellion. And it wasn't a rebellion for the mass. It was a, this again, I'm, this, I'm not officially in the religion. So my first line is, please forgive me if I err, <clears throat> excuse me, but what I'm trying to do is express aspects of our culture, which I learned, you know, on the South Bronx from, you know, gifted teachers. They just weren't academic teachers, right? They, they were madrinas, there were other folks, but they kept community together and they kept intellect and spirit alive. So Oshun is like, I'm not, I'm not doing this rebel coup thing. I'm not trying to accumulate, but I'm gonna fly. And Oshun's known for their beauty, right? And then they're based in water, but I'm gonna fly through towards the sun to reach Olo Dumare. So what happens, you know, their feathers become singed, they, they become scorched, they're half, you know, dead or desiccated. They have the appearance of, a, of an ashen gray vulture, but they petition for the return of waters. And it's that love. And this is why the, the title of the book, In Pursuit of Revolutionary Love. It's that flight towards our capacity to care, and right, I talk about the captive maternal as a function, but to care in ways that the captor cannot reach us mm -hmm. in terms of our psyche and our sexuality so that we can replenish so that we can fight again. I mean, once they control your psyche, and I think I've been reading um, Michael Sawyer's book on Malcolm, mm -hmm. and he talks a lot about Malcolm saying black thinking. And there's a quote he has from Malcolm where it's our consciousness that we need to shift, which we all know, right? In order to prepare for these types of engagements. And I don't think it's, at least for me, I can't do it without some form of spiritual guidance. And it's not enough, whatever I learned in seminary or Catholic school, I mean, yeah, and whatever, that was useful, but it's not what allows me to face a war, right? And so I, for me, and maybe we could talk about this more. I mean, what does love mean to you? Or, I mean, you make a really important contribution to the book, as does Devin, right? And there is this point when you're talking with me and you're asking questions and I say something like, you can't dance with the devil and come back with two feet. But then I do say, I do see do. I mean, because I'm in the academy and it's elite sector and whatever. But how does love discipline? And how does it um, revive us? Yeah, um, I feel like there are like multiple planes of struggle. And the highest plane to maybe pull from Cabral is like we've been, it's been interrupted, it's been diverted, mm -hmm. which is, you call, you say that revolutionary love is about sentience, not science. 
And I really sat with that because a lot of my work is interested in consciousness and not just like consciousness, like oh, I'm aware of things, but this experience of self-awareness, but also like a we, a we referent, that endowment, that singular evolutionary like miracle. And all of this diverts us. All of this, this is all this, you know, this desertification of being, like this dryness, this arid, you know, to pull on Fanon, this, this diverts us from the larger truths that we were, that our, you know, systems were after. That, that struggle for relation, that struggle for language, that struggle for feeling, to name feeling, to become feeling, you know, to dance into something, to, an, to dance into an ethic, to, to, to sing into, all of that has been diverted. There's a higher order um, task to me that it could be called spirit, it could be, it could be ushered under a number of like labels um, that all of this arrests and compromises and it's, we're being led to, this isn't, we're in the eco side death spiral at this point, you know, and now they're overriding everything they've done um, through ecology now. Ecology becomes like, now Haiti, for, I'm Haitian, so Haiti becomes ecological disaster as opposed to political manipulation, interference, and all the rest. Ecology is crowding out any other kind of claim when we all know it's, they're deeply um, implicated. But so there's my spirit exists at that higher order to access beauty, to, to, to push language, to push capa human capacity, to, to find out new ways of um, being in a community. All of that is lost, but we have to fight this front. But underneath, and I never let myself drift too far from the fact that I am I'm a living being. I am from, a, I come out of a moment, like a miraculous moment of creation um, that can never be served by the knowledge or the resources that the world we have currently provides. And that's what I'm after. Like, what would it truly be like to write, not just towards the end of empire, which is my earthly task, but to write towards a higher evolutionary thing. I mean, they've totally arrested human development. Uh, and that's the that's the tragic thing. But in these pockets, the maroon zones that you like to talk about, there is a vitalism. There there are seedlings um, in what we make. Uh, there's there's beauty. There's pulse. There's there's a vitalism. There's pure life uh, in pockets and places. But there's so much despair. And so I try to order my tasks in that way to never stray too far from that, like cosmic, right? Like what does Sran say that man is a cosmic? Yes. I mean, I don't think anyone understood um, as, as like angry, like, you know, some of his comrades would just say like, Fanon was scary. Like when he was in conferences with people just like stern and like too truthful maybe. And, but there's this underlying yes to life that I couldn't, I will never let go of. I will never compromise, but it becomes a matter of ordering them, aligning them and learning the great, and this is why that piece I wrote recently is about learning, um, hey, people often say Haiti is punished for the revolution. And I don't like that. Haiti is punished because it throughout, we just disappeared the 1800s totally when we say that. Haiti is punished because it, created institutionally mechanisms to refuse the accrual of capital on the world order's terms. That's why it's punished because I actually put in the institutional mechanisms between the rural and the, the the urban elite, between nation and state, between however we want to conceptualize Bosal, which in Haiti is like a derisive term for somebody that's kind of like, you know, from the countryside, but originally it meant somebody that was born in Africa and enslaved in the new world. Right, but it's still a term of derision when you kind of throw it around. But the Bosal, like that, the Bosal created networks, institutions, and ideological mechanisms to refuse accumulation on certain terms. That's why Haiti's punished. 
that's why you see, you know, we kind of skip to the debt, we, you know, we rely on the debt to kind of have this explanatory power. All of that is true and important, but we don't pay attention to what was built as mech, like barriers. Uh, and this comes with its own problems. Cause like Jean Casimir, one of our best theorists is like, then you can never actually strike at the center. You're striking in your own kind of, and it becomes this internal kind of mess. But we have the resources, we've done it, but it's been severely punished. And I'm talking about absolute hunger. I'm talking about levels of exposure to trafficking, mm -hmm. to the world's detritus. I mean, dumping fake rice on hungry people. You know, international assassins wiping out your president without a murmur from the world. So there's you, a level, sorry. There's levels of punishment, but like, yeah. So my, my spirit is nourished by the fact that um, there's a higher order task. Uh, okay, and but, I, uh, yeah, sorry. Sorry, I want to ask you more about that, but was, a couple of things came up, right? So when you were going through the, the list of, of, of torture and terror, right, also is thinking of UN peacekeepers coming and raping, you know, women and girls and leaving on babies behind, right? And, ha and having no accountability to against their violence or need to support the children, you know, that they're fathering or creating. I'm wondering, um, well, Okay, in the book, it begins with Deshaun Harrison, right, who won the Lambda Literary Award for their previous book. The, the forward is from Deshaun. The afterword is from Mumia, and they're great contributions. Beautiful. Mumia talks a lot about life in the spirit, the Orisha, and Harriet Tubman is their preferred captive maternal. Well, you know, mine is maybe Teal Mobley, but respect to all. Deshaun, <clears throat> excuse me, Deshaun talks, <clears throat> sorry, Deshaun talks a lot about death. So you're emphasizing life, which obviously, you know, we gravitate toward, it's magnetic. What is the balance? How do you see, you know, for me, a lot of the visuals is on the um, seesaw. So yeah. the Captain Maternal is the fulcrum, like, you know, right there. And that's how we, you know, go back and forth, the leveraging, stabilizing, et cetera. But the, the captivity from the state is it takes our generative powers and then it uses it to, you know, strengthen state, corporation, master state. How do you see death, though? Because it seems to me our proximity to death has to be assimilated into our love or reconciled with the way we love or we just fear death. And so we obey, we don't, and I'm the rebellion could just be intellectual, right? Or spiritual, but we, ref, you know, we, we, we fear or hate the African religions, right? As being primitive or not, whatever, that we fear or hate all black militant formations because it becomes like, as you said, the autonomous zones that the Haitians were able to create. Um, we look down on certain things related to Africa, right? So how, this, how do you balance the death and incorporate it into the love and fear so that you can actually cope with the stressors of always being threatened by some form of death, loss of job, loss of prestige, loss of your kids through foster care, loss of kin through imprisonment. Actually, Max Parthas is going to talk about the 13th oh. Amendment, you know, oh. it's slavery abolition, not prison abolition next week. So that's kind of like when I'm listening and I'm agreeing, but I'm wondering if our pursuit of love is trying to push away death rather than to come to terms with it. Yeah, no, that's, I had that on my, my list of questions for you. Like, what does agape, you know, you kind of pair agape and political will. Um, and my question was like, why, why now? What does it, what need are you serving and providing that language of agape? Um, and does it have to do with kind of the pervasive death dealing or the premature death? Or I guess I would say one 
part of my dissertation looks at pregnant enslaved rebels. So like insurgencies led by pregnant slaves. And I mean, there's not a huge archive for that. Um, but I wanted to understand how you can live in a death function or a war function that actually needs you to regenerate yourself. And so it, it has a natal, it's a death drive with a natal dimension. And there's this like literary theorist, I think his name is Cassidy Pinkin, who does this interesting analysis of the oceanic, what he calls the oceanic division of like reproductive labor. And essentially he's saying that like, it's, it's the capacity to regenerate, well, this is the language I give to what he kind of identifies, is to regenerate what you've killed that is unique to that new world slavery that you can maim, you can eliminate, you can have these seven year, you know, uh, lifespans, but you can also instantaneously regenerate labor and life. Of course, all of that labor and reproductive power comes out of Africa and it's centuries long, you know, they're, pull, they're, they're, they're capitalizing on century long reproductive labor on the continent, but it's that ability to instantaneously regenerate. And, to, and it gives blackness a regenerative capacity. So I guess this is to say, like life and death might mean the same thing. And that is also pulling on my voodoo roots where I don't see, perhaps I don't see them as so antithetical. Perhaps you can name the same thing either with saying death or with life, I don't know. Um, and then you can't run away from the death function of war. Um, so I think in, in centralizing war, I'm trying to centralize. I mean, Africa is the youngest continent. I mean, it has the youngest, and, it, and it's a population. And, it ex and I'm like, what will they do with us? Vital, young, and, you know, and becoming the newest theater of global warfare, where the war on terror is being pulled down. And it's gonna, Africa is going to be the, the beating heart of, a return to hard geopolitics, in my opinion. I think with Ukraine and what's happening now, this is, we're going back to the good old power politics, but with whole new technological capacity. But Africa is going to be the beating heart where these things are settled. Um, so war for me is centering, like think about that being the, like not aging. I mean, we're used to this, we know this. And you said Jonathan comes back to you. That's how you know, like, there's like a resurrect, a, a, a capacity for resurrection because he's with you. And like, you're like, I can't speak for anybody else, but he remains. And there's something spiritual about that for me. So I guess this is all to say that like, I hope the war, like focusing on the mechanisms of war centers how important elimination and death are to contemporary politics, all politics, but also that we sit differently there's like, we sit differently in that. Like they, they needed us to regenerate ourselves, you know, especially the US, where, which becomes a domestic, you know, it, you, the population actually reproduces itself in large numbers. Whereas in the Caribbean and parts of Latin America, it's the, it's the traffic that, you know, does the reproductive work. Uh, so I wanted to sit with that, with like, what kind of war is a natal war, hmm. you know? Most are processes of incapacitation, elimination, containment. They need you to make yourself. How does that natal thing carry on? And how might it shape how we think about life? Um, how we think about this regenerative power that they think we have? Like there's this, this other element that I always found fascinating, like on slave ships, if the slave got shot, like stuck in the Atlantic, they'd be like, okay, which one of you is controlling the weather? You know, like, you know, before science, the seams of science really close in on and they would whip people, they would tie them to the mast, they would do, there's all sorts of interesting stories in the archive about punishing captives because they're stopping the tides, they're stopping the wind. They're, so this endowment of like a, a, a regenerative thing, it starts in the kind of theological thinking, but it filters all the way down to how they manage us in a secular way. And so I focus on life because our, our capacity for life is just so central to how all of this functions, but with never without acknowledging that war 
war is death. And that's why that's I like, yeah. So what I, I was saying when you mentioned Jonathan, I think people know you mean Jonathan Jackson. Yeah. And so, <clears throat> sorry, there's a chapter in the book where Rebecca Ann Wilcox. Yeah, who, that, that is my favorite conversation. of Yeah, that, that lasted a really long time. But we're arguing back and forth. And um, my respect to Rebecca, you know, because they're arguing with me and saying that I'm not clear enough. Right. Mm -hmm. And also they're at Princeton Seminary. So then it, it's and it's part of the political theology network. So, again, I was in seminary, but I left early. And that's what I said. I mean, it, I went what I said. I was seeking the gifts of God and I found it to be, you know, a business or a store. And I was like, I, you know, I can do other things with my time. And I left. Right. But I was trained by some prominent like liberation theologians, black theologians. Right. So I learned some things. But. The thing about Jonathan, to go back to the the merger of, of life and death, I mean, I remember this 17-year-old who I never met because of an act of love that was encircled by death, right? So the California prisons, if I recall correctly, had a law that there will be no escapes under any conditions, and we don't care who you shoot and kill. It's just like our right. manifestation of power is now nobody walks out of here without like a, a piece of paper that we signed onto. So he's in the van. Of course, he's using Davis's guns. And so that's how they get involved. But they have nothing to do with planning, you know, which is why, you know, they're exonerated. Um, also, it helps to have, you know, six attorneys and a lot of backing international. Right. Because we, as we know, it's not enough to be innocent to not be incarcerated. You have to have resources. But he's in the van with um, three incarcerated men, including Rusha McGee, who we always say on this platform is 83, still in prison. People need to think we collectively, individually, how we can contribute to bringing him out. But the state kills the white judge makes the white DA paraplegic, shoots and wounds a white juror, kills two of the men, Christmas and McLean, and then shoots and maims um, Rochelle McGee, who survives, right, to be a co-defendant until their cases, Davis and McGee's cases are severed. And of course, shoots and kills Jonathan. So for me, that stunning array of the master and the state I mean, this is when, you know, the plantation owner is like, I'm just going to drown like eight of you to make an example to the 800 of you. So you remember when I say, you know, work for 14 hours under the lash, you'll remember these dead bodies. Right. And for me, I said to Rebecca, this is it's a haunting, but it's not a haunting that scares me, even though it's horrific. So I'm this is my question really is and I, I'm repetitive, but, you know, I'm trying to learn. How is it that we deal with death and terror? And if there's anything that we could structure in our consciousness or in our teachings with each other, collective teachings, that would amplify our capacity. And Janine Jones, the philosopher, talks a lot about capacity, right? And I know you two have spoken. That our capacity for handling terror and intimidation, or, you know, we could go from Tyree to whoever is going to be shot next week or trafficked, right? Or, you know, bombed through, drone strike through AFRICOM. How is it that that comes to our consciousness and doesn't just settle in our nervous system? Yeah. Does that make sense? It, it, it does. And I have no, I honestly have no answer. I think I find fortification. I think I have a line in that recent piece that's like, political abandonment is like a, a, a strategy of containment to say like when we um, forget, disappear, repress, or simply just don't have the time for people that were devotional. Yeah, the um, devoted. The devoted. Like I am not, I have to be honest here. Am I among the devoted? Probably not. Like um, when I and I isolate that devotion, I'm talking about very particular people. Like in the piece, it's like um, Bukhari and Maurice Bishop, and it's two people I'm trying to think with lately. But um, there's a reverence that you have 
for people that have been pilfered from because no one can do it as good as them. Like when you write about Foucault and George Jackson, they're pilfered from, they're mocked, they're um, people who are afraid of them. Mm -hmm. And what you do for me is you build a capacity to remain devoted to their devotion. And that, like I don't know, a friend was talking to me about how like when you have something stressful um, and, it, and you don't complete the cycle of the stress, it lives in your nervous system, as you said. So what does it mean to complete the cycle of, of like a, a stressful cycle? And, and I return to your kinds of writing because there's, you're unflinching in your ability to elevate and defer that humility to defer to to those that walk the walk. And this is not a deference. Like I know there's that new great book, Elite Capture, that really, Obisami Tayo, who talks about how, you know, identity politics creates these like mechanisms of deference that are, they're not helpful. You know, all of a sudden you're an expert because you're just sitting there and you're this or that. But there's another kind of deference and it's the deference to the devoted. It requires humility. It requires self-awareness. Um, so that's all to say to me when I feel, you feel, I, I said to my husband, I'm like, we look cowardly and we, I feel cowardly in sitting here watching another execution. I feel embarrassed. I feel, you know, you feel small. So returning to those who I don't know, ate the fear. Like I talk to my students a lot about how fear is fundamental to our political life. Um, and so I don't think there's, I don't think there are any answers, but how do we work through fear? What are, what are the things that actually allow us to work through fear? What are the things that actually give us clarity? To me, it's this very deep, but spiritual deference that people like you and others, um, my advisor, Anthony, but there's so many people that you won't be disciplined out of, you know, celebrating who really, you know, threw down, as you like to say. Uh, and I think just act that calisthenic of exercising um, that deference and, and, and thinking about devotion and challenging us to think about what devotion may look like, that gets me going. I don't, I don't, I really don't know. I think like, I think we're in the post BLM era now. I think BLM has exhausted as like a framework that really did move people. What in whatever direction is like questionable, but its capacity to gather people, I think to, to absorb and redistribute energy is like, it's done. I think that we're into a new kind of phase of whatever this popular conversation will be. I think we might begin to call it the post BLM era or something like that. And so I, I think reintroducing um, these names, like in your, your piece with Holder, you talk about how you, you root black studies in the prison tradition. There are so many different accounts of black studies. That is one like I have never encountered. Um, and yeah, so I guess this is all to say, I think we can only fortify and I think you can only complete cycles of like these, these trauma cycles um, through deeper and deep uh, conversation about deeper and deeper devotion. And I know that gets into like a weird spiritual language again, but I, I bring up the spirit of your text because I think that's what's needed. I mean, this is such a crippling and, and demoralizing and like discursively empty. It's so empty. It's so empty. But it's a sterile environment in terms of it's very sterile. But, but, and I know like Kalanji and Jared have a lot to say, or, but I want to just sort of end on this part, right? So when you were speaking, it reminded me of Georgia Bia Jackson, George Jackson's mother. And what she said in a small interview somewhere after, you know, both, both sons are murdered by the state. Totally unnecessary. Like if you're surrounding a van, just shoot out the tires. Nobody's going to drive anywhere, right? Or, you know, if, if George says the prison guards are going to kill me and, and he shares that with his younger brother and the younger brother becomes a catalyst for devotion, like a love not just to the personal family member, but the love to the concept of Black freedom, or at least if we're not going to be free, we won't be your slave. 
right? Yeah. So Georgia Bia Jackson says like after they're both murdered by the state, and I'm assuming these are black people because I don't think she cares about white strangers. When they see her coming, they cross the sidewalk, right? So they're in some places where I've talked about crossing the sidewalk. Like, I'm just gonna like go over, like, cause we don't want to bump into each other, but they literally don't want to recognize her as mm -hmm. devotional. They want to shame her for having mm -hmm. like, you had these black boys and you couldn't so control sad. yeah. Yeah. Like, weren't they supposed to, like, get a nine-to-five job or, like, you know, it's like, no, they wanted to be free. Oh, you had free Black boys. Oh, no, that's, like, too much, right? And so, I mean, I'm going back because this is what I'm grappling with as well. We all are, right? Because everybody here, you know, helps to raise people or support. On one level, the fear tells you to discipline this is the captive yeah. maternal stages. Like those early stages, we're gonna discipline you, we need to lock you down so you don't rebel, so you exist, you know, you can make it out of childhood. Well, you know, Terry was like 29, whatever you made it out to and not rebelling, working for UPS as a driver, whatever, you know, skateboarding. It, it's irrelevant really on certain levels. But I do agree when I look at Rochelle or I look at Mumia, that I do feel, I don't want to say an obligation as a political thing, but there is this sense of that I should be recognizing the people who sacrificed everything as an expression of devotion to us and to freedom. Or even if it wasn't a devotion of love, it was a devotion to end the war by fighting in the war, right? however you want to define that. But I'm just going to be honest. I, I, there's so much emotional or psychological or devotional, or, you know, spiritual content moving around. I'm not quite sure how to organize it, but I do appreciate the term of devotion because I, like I say, I'm not a revolutionary. I'm not even good at devotional anything like from prayer. I mean, it's just hit and miss depends on the day with me. But there is something that drives us even to, you know, be here at 8 a.m. on a Monday morning that we're devoted to something. I just wish we had a more public language to that so that when the funders come to flood and direct with their hundreds of millions of dollars, billions, whatever, our movements, we can understand from the side of devotion that we can say no to the money or we can say no to the co-optation or we can say no to whatever. Or if we take the money, you know, which is fine because it's a resource, we'll direct it back into communities, but never try to leverage ourselves above community. Yeah, no, I think you're, you know, you're spot on with when something becomes ubiquitous, we got to be like, okay, what's, what is it serving? What is it containing? Um, I think what I want to do is study what triggers people into that level of devotion, like a really systematic study with whatever resources we have at our disposal. Like what, what, how do people step into that? And so that's one project I have. And then another is the other side of it, which is schism. How have schisms internally, um, played out fractured movements and like what can we learn from that pattern of because you know schisms are natural to any kind of like political analysis factions are going to be created but there have been some fatal schisms um obviously stoked by the state but like Bukhari says fractricidal elements within you know you're you're in the surround as like Josh Meyer says in Fred Moden but like I want to study how do we better have a handle on what gets people to that degree of commitment, analysis, spirit, like whatever it is. And what would that offer us? If we can just slow down and, and think about like, how, well, how does that conversion actually happen? So that's one thing I have. And then also, once we get that converted, why, how does schism like shake out? Why and how can we kind of guard against you know, certain things? So those are like my two projects. But all I can commit to right now is like, okay, who are these people? 
why? Like what brought them? You know, I'll do like an epigraph to one of my chapters is from George Jackson. He says, both Huey and Jonathan are understandably calling for the program revolution to take into account the fact of racial genocide. Jonathan is calling from his grave, adding another voice to the many thunderous graveyard affirmations, which for us Black speeds the revolution to its ultimate issue. And so the chapter is named Graveyard Affirmations from the Household of Imperial Democracy. And that idea of the graveyard affirmation um, is what compelled like my Thing about devotion and wanting to study this but all and their study is like insufficient george says at one point you put down the books and you know but that conversion it's something I, I want to stoke in myself and others and so that's all i can do with how things are aligned right now but i, I think it's up for grabs and like a whole program of action can't rest or be couched in words like a name of a war will never supplant uh you know feeding people, solving hunger, restoring psyches, you know, creating the symbolic resources. It, it can't do that. But I'm, I'm hoping to identify the things that have gotten people there and to offer that back. Um, Cause that's what's within my capacity. And I'm trying to have no illusions about how um, effective I am. Cause that's part of the problem. I think too, is when you have illusions about what you can do as an individual or even as a collective, you know, not to say don't dream big and don't, you know, but listening to the graveyard affirmations mm -hmm. is my guiding light in a period of, we're just in a period of total transition. Like, I really don't think um, the techniques of the 20th century, I think there are certain things that are enduring about rebellion and enduring about political processes, but I do think there's a major break. And I know like academics, thinkers don't like, oh, continuity, everything, you know, I think there's a major break afoot. I think the screen, the way like social life is organized, the way feeling is ciphered into pixels, like all of this is different. I will, I will, I'm, I will rest on that. And I think there is a need, there's just, it's an op there's an openness to all this that is like terrifying and also really like, okay, maybe we could do something different. And that's why I think becoming part of like a anti-war global thing is how I envision my next movement. Like you have this conversation with the Kurdish um, theorist and like, you know, she's considered a terrorist by the state of Turkey, um, Nizan Ustendag. And both of you like were really, I wrote about this in my dissertation, vibing on, how the concept of war brings all of you together. And she has this quote of like, well, we forsake the humanitarian shelter of conversations on violence. When you let go of the humanitarian shelter of what you're allowed to say about violence, and then you prioritize war, then all of a sudden you have a different global alliance. You're bringing in different views. And the Kurds have such a fascinating, to me, a parallel experience in some ways, it's an experience we can learn from. Um, and the fact that both of you were so moved by each other's analyses of war brought me to this idea of like abolition war. And so like, that's something I try to spend some time thinking about. Like we have a history of abolition wars, what would be the future of abolition wars and whatever else. But I mean, that's all to say, yeah, the graveyard affirmations and um, really being clear about what stands in front of us. Just don't, I think there's a break. I don't know. I don't know. Yeah, yeah. no, I, I agree with you. And, and, and I, I promise I will stop after this. But for me, it's so great to see you and, and to be in conversation. Yeah, and the Kurdish women also talk about democratizing violence. Right. Because they're, they have units. I believe they're Muslim, right? So they're all Kurdish women fighting units. But they also talked about the internal contradictions, which maybe as, um, you know, other people come in the conversation, we can talk about it. But and like, I'm like, oh, I don't know who I'm supposed to not be supposed to talking to according to the State Department, but whatever. Right, right. So, like, thing, so thanks for bringing that up, Felicia. No, um, it's, it's a phenomenal conversation. No, that's, I, I'm, I, being I, snarky, I'm being snarky. That's a joke. <laughs> like, you know, like, I was trying to be low key, undercover, but like nobody ever heard that podcast discussion. But anyway, so one of the things that they talk about is the violence inside the community, yeah. you know, because f people are dysregulated, you know, they're hyper, they're violent, they're whatever the thing is, they think women and girls are prey. 
And they said, the first thing we do is we sit down, we have like a round table discussion and we explain to you, like there will be no rape and there will be no domestic violence against your female partner. And I guess they would do, we'll, we'll deal with the psychological, emotional is right, but we're focusing on the physical, but we're called all registered. We understand you guys are under stress, like we're being hunted and killed, but you know, you can't do blowback on us. And we will have that discussion. And then if it keeps going on, they're like, okay, we'll have a second discussion, which we will remind you of the first discussion. And then the third thing is like, okay, you know, democratize violence, which means we're trained just like you are. And so if you keep this up, we will treat you as an, you know, we will use violence against your violence. It's not going to be therapy. We already had two meetings with you. If yeah. you're going to keep beating your wife or you're going to be raping somebody, then we explained to you to stop. We offered you support to stop. You refused to stop. So now this is another war on war. And I was like, okay. I mean, for me, that it made sense. But I don't know, you know, because, you know, the theoretical verbal stuff going on now, right? Like Rebecca is telling me that everybody's using my work right, in masculinist mm -hmm. studies, certain kind of feminist studies. And I was thinking when I was uh, talking to uh, Mama Dutal and Kadisha Diskin, you have to meet them. I mean, it's virtual, they're, they're in UK, right? So we were, we were talking over the weekend. They're also in the book, In Pursuit of Revolutionary War. But, you know, they were saying, um, all these folks are using the captive maternal and they're interpreting in different ways. So now it looks like you hate black feminism. And so this, you know, so the masculinists are using it in other ways. And then the feminists are like, I don't know exactly what they're saying, but anyway, people are saying different things. And since I'm not on social media, I don't want to know what anybody's saying. And so like, keep it to yourselves. Right. But there does seem to be um, a way in which internally, we have allowed things to become blurry or sloppy in terms of gender conflict. And some people would call it antagonism. So our ability to unify, to deal with the wars, the predatory wars from the master and the state, th that capacity is diminished unless we can, I'm not saying do it like the Kurdish women were doing it. Or, I don't know, maybe do it, I don't know, figure it out. But, we, we don't seem to have a strategy for reconciliation. And so what I ended up saying a couple of days ago, I guess it's gonna air this week or something. I was saying, this is these wars, internal wars, some of them are starting to look like brands, right? Mm. Because it's like, here's my body of thought and I'm gonna sell it. And so the devotion for me isn't there because there's nothing higher to discipline it. Like mm. even if I never met Rochelle or I only wrote him a few times, I should have written more. Like I'm always failing. So it almost feels like fake. Like you're never meeting, nobody's view people are gonna do what a shoon does, fly into the heat in order to bring back resources. And I feel this is what our political prisoners and our rebels did. So when you say about natality, the ability to generate, I think of Asada getting pregnant while she's on trial. And then, ha you know, then in order to see her daughter, she like, okay, I need to leave prison now. And then people do things, they sacrifice, people get incarcerated. Silvio Berardini has her incredible interview with um, Kalonji Janga, Janga. But anyway, I hope I'm not sounding like, a, like I'm all over the place and maybe I am, but I'm wondering if we have to take care of some internal business while we're facing, right, the master state alliance to consume us as edibles and then spit us out. And, I, and I'm not sure how we balance those tasks. You know, I mm -hmm. mean, we're going to start reading George um, in a couple of weeks, Blood in My Eye. We've divided into four sections over four weeks. Um, on, I said the 13th is Max Parthas. On the 20th, who's coming? Um, Kalanji or Jared? Zach Kondo. Yes. Sorry. Zach Kondo. 
Mm -hmm. Malcolm, it's the day before Malcolm's assassination. You know, Malcolm is assassinated as Kalanji and Jarrett have put on the table. Again, this is all collective thinking is just coming out of my mouth. Uh, Malcolm's assassinated, George is assassinated, Jonathan's assassinated. We have to deal with our devotion to their memory, their intent, their spirituality. But at the same time, we have these internal contradictions of competition, of mm -hmm. um, co-optation. You know, even what does George mean when now he's marketable to mainstream readers. That was, you know, I mean, cause I was at Brown and I've said before why I left, right? It's cause, you know, inviting, you know, BLA or, you know, RNA, Sevilla Picard, like the rebels come to campus. And again, 20 years ago, that's like forbidden and people freak out. 20 years later, I mean, that's a quote, cool thing. And so now they're appearing and how is, Memory enough is not a form of devotion if their memory is now compatible to liberal consumption. So now they're popularizing, and then I feel like a jerk if I point that, like, why are you talking about them? It's like, one, you don't own them. And I'd say, that's real. And two, your interpretation of them isn't even going to be that important because once they become part of the marketplace of ideas, capital will interpret them as well. Mm -hmm. And I don't think there'll ever be a George Jackson day like there's an MLK national holiday, but there's gonna be some variation of, well, whatever he was saying, like Ida B. Wells, they completely reinvented Ida B. Wells, right? Or Harriet Tubman's statue in the quad of the CIA, which we talked about in a previous episode. Their ability to capture our spirit of devotion is worries me as much as their ability to shoot us down in the street. Mm. Can I just throw in there quickly? Isn't that mm. what you two talk about in terms of your definition of abolitionism also? What's happening to all of these things? Or did I miss here? Felicia? Yeah, I mean, I posed that question to you in the interview, which is like, do you hold the line? Do you add all of these qualifiers? And I think at some point you're like, I'm not interested in doing like language games. Um, you know, and I think it becomes about the ideas. Like the market glee, like it attaches to personality. Ideas, but personality. But when you devote, when you take George Jackson's words, and you spin them into a contemporary analysis of war or like what he calls the fact of racial genocide, which very few people would affirm that there is a fact of racial genocide um, or that the category of genocide itself relies on conceptual repressions, that it is actually coherent only insofar as it denies the function of genocide that preceded it or it'll be spinned on you like whenever haiti comes up online people are like oh well desaline committed genocide like he's bad and i'm like genocide wasn't a category in 1804 like it'll be spun back you know so it's to me it's about um not letting the ideas remain self-contained but ushering them forward in a way that retains their edge that makes them unusable if you're not willing to go to the yeah, fact yeah. of racial gender. Do you know what I mean? I don't know, yeah, that's one like market buffer that I find, I find you'll find people quoting specific things. You'll uh, find a particular sure. kind of engagement with like many thinkers, like even, you know, like, uh, yeah, well, I mean, it gets get into people, but we are good at parsing and amplifying. And then that amplification does a whole other work of containment. There are other components of these thinkers that are simply cannot be assimilated. They just can't. They're just too, it's too unruly. It's too aggressive. It's, it's too, too, too. So I'm always like looking for those components, but doing my work, which is moving the paradigm forward. And that's what I hope they, they, I got this thing from more from listening to reading what people were saying in the sixties and seventies, you know? So this is not like, oh, I came up and, uh, but 
reanimating something that, for example, I think Foucault in the Academy is a good metric for how this goes. He's writing about war and then he kind of shifts to governmentality. And you kind of told me that that paralleled just the end of conversations about war as a category in intellectual communities in the early 90s. It kind of just, just gets disappeared and it becomes governmentality or all these other ways of like talking about management. But, but yeah, because it becomes, I mean, sorry to jump in, but it's like the mask assassination of George Jackson, right? So Jean Genet is trying to get Foucault interested mm -hmm. in George's case before he's murdered. And then they produce this pamphlet. And actually I wrote this piece, which nobody will publish last three, four years. But it was like, okay, I'm, I'm, I have a critique of Foucault here, right? How you use this black revolutionary, you know, I, masculinity, I'm putting in quotes, because I'm not sure where masculinity and femininity stop and start, right? So I'm, I'm not, these are constructs for me, and some of them mostly are performative. But it is almost as if they usurp the energy and the knowledge and the, the guerrilla re intellectualism and rebellion of George to put in this pamphlet. And of course they're outraged, you know, this is after he's killed and so they'll call it an assassination. And because these French intellectuals are calling it that, then Americans who are Europhiles are like, oh, maybe we should pay attention. But there's a way in which I feel like they return him, they reduce George into an edible, like um, is it Vincent Woodard, um, the delectable, delectable Negro, Negro. Like the black queer theorist who, who died, you know, um, a number of years ago and his colleagues, um, I don't know if their colleagues, you know, constructed the book, but they're talking about the enslavement era where we're, we're not just racialized, we're sexualized in a particular queer way, right? And then we're reduced to um, edible consumption. Like the whole point is, that were desired on all these metrics. And again, this is why I think AP sometimes is very important to think about because they're talking about psychological desire, um, right, yeah. phobias about blackness, but then you're attracted Amelia. to- yeah. Or then why are, you, why are your hands always up in black hair? It's just like, that's natural and stuff. Like, why are you yanking on somebody's dreadlocks as a white girl, you know, when there's a, you know, a brother standing in front of you just trying to go through a queue, right? And a black, you point this out to a black cop and you go, well, can I yank her hair? You know, the blonde's hair. And they're like, oh, no, that's forbidden. But yeah, she yanked your hair. Well, that happens, right? So there's, you know, George becomes an edible, right? And when that happens, it's almost like you would have to, can you even retrieve George from academic elites? And Foucault also visited Attica. And as my students, when I was teaching at Brown pointed out, and it was a black sister, wait, you had us read this stuff. And again, I need to go back and let read the literature again. Perhaps I'm in error, you know, might be, but let's just say, what's the possibility that Foucault toured Attica and just looked at the bloodstains and, you know, the, the, what was left of carnage in this empty building and talked about architecture not about the murdered rebels. Mm -hmm. And that's, you know, this is the shift. And I don't know that we can even, what is fidelity then to the rebel? What is fidelity, which is a form of devotion to the revolutionary, which then becomes fidelity, devotion to the rebellion itself. And it, when we're tampering with content, you know, it's almost like, selling you a plastic Jesus or something, mm -hmm. right? Like to stick in your car or the cross. The signifier doesn't represent the struggle, mm -hmm. the loss and the redemption through sacrificial love. Mm -hmm. And but I'm not sure we can not lock that down. Sorry, go ahead, Kalonji. No, no, I'm sorry for cutting you off. But um, no, I mean, you know, I, I think that you know, to answer your question, um, we can absolutely retrieve, right? You know what I'm saying? Our, our liberators. It has to be coupe tete boule kai, right? We have to, <laughs> we, we, we have to, we have to, we have to take it there. And I think the thing is, 
um, we sit on the sideline and we watch these mm. characters uh, commodify our freedom fighters and our ancestors and this ancestor of treason. And, and, and we are guilty as well when we sit back and we allow George to be commodified. We are guilty as well when we allow the CIA to put up a, 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 a statue of Harriet Tubman. But the thing is, these academics, they're approachable. They're like the local politicians. We have to deal with them like we're supposed to. You know, the position has to be when we talk about from a spiritual aspect, while we're praying for our advancement and our survival, we should pray that the spirit of George Jackson comes and deal with them. Because I think that the thing is they tamper that word that you use. They tamper with some things that they shouldn't be tampering with, you mm -hmm. know. So the thing is, until we decide that we are serious about our own liberation, they will continue to play with our liberation. They will mm. continue to put Malcolm on a stamp. They will continue to talk about doing some faulty movie about George. But we have to deal with these folks accordingly. And the way we combat it, first and foremost, is when we're on these platforms like we're on now, we have to bring out the raw grit of what these freedom fighters are talking about. The problem is we dance, but we're not trying to dance like George. We dance, but we're not trying to be Jonathan. So it, it begs the question of when we talk about war, what is war without retribution and a redistribution of pain? If war is only us being massacred, then we're not at war. We're in a war. And I think that we have to be clear as we talk about these terms because we will confuse ourselves into believing that we're fighting when we're not doing Jack Diddley squat. We're sitting back playing the role and being victimized. You understand what I'm saying? But as uh, Comrade Daruba pointed out, a revolutionary is not a victim. And we mm. can't continue to play the role of the victim. So I have a real problem with sitting back allowing, I don't care about how many books you wrote, what your press is, I'll rip your book up in front of you. And we will denounce it because of the fact that you are disrespecting our ancestors. That's mm. how I'm looking at it. When you violate our political prisoners and you try to make a check off of our political prisoners, you deserve to be checked. Because like you, we talk about Rochelle McGee, indeed, it's been 60 years, that's six decades, six decades that he's been in these gulags. And you have these folks who walk around and, and they parade around these different campuses. They make a whole lot of money for touring and saying his name and all that type of stuff. That has to stop. And we have to be clear about what our struggle is about. It, you can't just come with all these different nuances. You can't just throw a spin on it. Black August has nothing to do with a party. Black August mm. has nothing to do with certain uh, uh, events or freedom fighters. It is about political prisoners. And we have to be clear. It's about our folks who were martyred. It was about our folks who were kidnapped. And when we talk about George, we got to talk about George like George talks. Mm. Not like what these French writers are talking about. Not like what the Boston Globe is talking about. Not like what Angela Davis is talking about. We got to talk about George like George is talking. And if we're afraid to do so, then we should shut up, too. We should mm -hmm. shut up as well because we're doing a disservice. We can't keep playing games. Damn right. Name their names. I'm sorry. It, it is very personal when it comes to our ancestors. If it was mm -hmm. your mother, if it was your child, you wouldn't sit back and allow someone to talk reckless about your child or your mother when you know the truth. Mm -hmm. You wouldn't sit back and allow anyone to make money uh, or make a career off of your loved one. So if you love revolution and you love freedom fighting and you love George Jackson, then you should love approaching these folks in whatever way by any means necessary, as they would say. Right. So this mm -hmm. is this is how I look at it. Um, I know that you, you all talked about the whole uh, piece on devotion. I think that when we talk about our liberation movement, spirit moves us in different ways. Right. I can't write. I can't think. Or I can't talk about certain freedom fighters without a spirit of devotion. You understand what I'm saying? Because I recognize that, you know, in my tradition, you know, we come, you know, as they say, energy never dies. So our spirit never dies. So I'm a believer in the fact I'm a believer in our spirit existing and it transferring into different situations. And that even goes out to the folks who are on the street, the so-called so uh, uh, street organizations. A lot of these folks are warriors who haven't gotten their proper information just yet. 
You understand what I'm saying? But what happens is a lot of these uh, quote, quote unquote academics, a lot of these folks who are uh, grassroots and nonprofit, again, they commodify the situation. So they don't want to touch certain things. They don't want certain people on the same set as them because of the fact that the, the wool would be pulled off. So now they're seated. OK, you're, you're not really a Sada's daughter. Hmm. You're not. You're, you're not blood in my eye. You don't have any blood in your eye. You understand what I'm saying? You're not a gorilla. You know, you're not a new panther or old panther or whatever that is. That's not you. And and we don't have to necessarily just go on a rampage attacking folks, but we have to. I was taught from my OGs that we have to correct the wrong on the spot. We can't just mm. let it go. I can't let Joy James is cool. That's my comrade or whatever. So I can just let her say whatever she want to say. It don't go like that. No, no. Because of the fact that this is when we have to separate the individual from the movement. And mm. if we're not a part of a movement, then we're cannon fodder. That's key. That's key. Like my advisor said to me, he sees when I was a first year in grad school, like my mind is split between the street and the classroom. And he's going to do his best to help me like reconcile that. And there's a difference between theorizing from a formation. And then what I'm doing, which is like, you're writing a book, you're trying to provide reason, but there, there's two different urgencies. You produce different things. It produces different levels of relevance. And I learn from everything and anyone, but I, I that is, is so key. Who is actually theorizing from a collective body of act, like that's committed to action versus sitting at your desk, which is what I'm up to right now. I'm not, I just moved here. I'm not part of anything. I haven't been part of anything in a while. I'm still trying to figure out terrain. What is there? You know, that is, I just appreciate these words, this reminder, the checking on the spot becomes like, um, you're right. You're right. And, and they wouldn't be able to get away with these things if we were more militant and aggressive about holding the line, as they like to say. And so it's a good reminder. And um, yeah, sometimes I think about like, how far can my work go if you're not theorizing from formation? You're just theorizing in the ether um, and checking my own checking my own self. But you're right. There's it's profitable. Mm. It's this is you know, this is unprecedented in the way it's profitable and so it's about curtailing that but also how do you bring people in that's like the one thing that i think i offer is like a bridge like how do you bring people in with the capacity and the potential the street warriors like you said that just don't have the resources yet how, that's the kind of front that i how do you make the analysis of war the, the, the base, like the foundational analysis for people? I had a student say, oh, it would be crazy if I went home. Because the Black Lives Matter platform starts with end the war on, end the war on, end the war on, which to me is really interesting. Like, where did they get the language? What was the conversation? Oh, my student was like, if I went home and told my parents that I'm learning that there's a war on Black people, they would like flip their mind. But she's like, this, this is it. And so I'm like, how do I work as that bridge, but also that 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 wall against when I occupy the position that I don't know facilitates the theft. Look look at it like this. Look look at um who we, we have to we have to um look at who we're studying, right? So if we're talking about George and we're talking about Malcolm, how did they do it? Mm. You know what I'm saying? Sometimes we 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 listening we're hearing the words or we're reading the words and we're trying to get these ideas and these thoughts, you know, but you have to embody, right? Mm. You have to say, okay, boom, where was George when he became George? You mm, understand mm -hmm. what I'm saying? And, 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 and what was he doing? What was he really into? Where was Malcolm when he became Malcolm? Right. They weren't in the Academy. Right. And it's not a diss to the Academy. I'm just telling you, this is what we're talking about. So this is how we have to roll. Now, I'm not saying that you have to go all the way out and be just like them, but I'm just saying you in, in Christianity, they say that Jesus spoke the language of the people. That's one thing that you have to do. You have to speak the language of the people. You can't reach the people if you're not amongst the people. Right. Mm -hmm. So everyone's not going to be on Guerrilla Intellectual University. Right. So we have to say, OK, boom. One of the things that Bunchy Carter did uh, out in, 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 in L.A. was he would they would throw these discos and whatnot. 
and in the middle of the joint when things is bumping and it is and everybody's live he'll stop the music get up on the table and start start teaching he got enough crew with him he has enough crew with him that that you're not gonna I mean, you ain't going to be like, you know, turn the music back on. I don't want to hear this. You know what I mean? You have to make this whole. When we're up against capitalism and we're up against imperialism, we have to match their fire. We have to match their flyness. Right. We can't just walk around with, you know, looking like, you know, um, like we're trying to recruit someone into the culture you have to use the cherry cough job theory you gotta make it taste so good they forget it's medicine you gotta put a beat on it you gotta make it look fly you understand what i'm saying there, there's no rules that we have to be these poor righteous teachers where you have to look a certain way you got to act right, a certain right, way right, whatever right, 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 but you right, have right. to be able to reach the people where they are and i think that that's where we fall short and we allow these other individuals to stand up on their 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 uh uh, ivory towers from their ivory towers and tell you what the issues are and because they have a publishing deal then they're allowed to get away with certain things because the press the state's press mm -hmm. will allow them to be the spokesperson for us but we have to denounce the press that they're coming from so we got to go right to the root yes this particular uh, uh, press joint, they also put out these books. Uh, this particular newspaper, they also put out this right here. How can you stand with them? How can you side with them and say that, you know, you're representing what we're representing when this is something that George or Malcolm would have shunned? You know, so we got we got to go from that particular angle. If, if I can, I just want to throw something out because I think I think I might even I think I think I disagree slightly. Uh, well, I'm just in a different space, so I'm, I wanna, I'm open to being checked on this. And so I just, I just want to make this quick point. Then I'd like to just throw out a couple of others and then sit back and continue to enjoy listening. Um, I am less interested in trying to recruit and expand. I'm more interested mm -hmm. in doing what I feel like we're doing here, which is um, building among those who are already so-called converted to a certain point and figuring out how we can become more effective working with each other and become more disruptive. I've kind of, and this is why one of the points I wanted to ask you uh, about is, is Joy, when you, when you, I see you constantly struggling with this, with, with Afro-pessimism. Um, and I keep wanting to ask you why you aren't one or why why you feel like, as you said in this chapter, they've recruited you because and, and I don't mean and I think I'm misdefining my even my own interpretation of it when I say I'm bringing that up to say that. I wanted to say I feel like I'm in a more pessimistic moment in terms of trying to compete with empire. Mm -hmm. I don't think we can make it. We, I just we can't keep this. Idea. We're and in part because I've just been watching a lot of their product, trying to be critical of it. And let I'm like, we're never going to. Right. Let me, let me just finish this real quick. And then I, I, I'll happily, I don't, I'll just let you all go, go. Like we, if like we, we're never going to make a fly product like they make. We're never going to make uh, revolution look as fly as they make selling out look. Um, it's, we, we can't magnify, I, you know, what we're doing to match what they're doing. So what I would like to do is to say, for those of us who feel we've hit a certain level of, of, again, conversion or whatever we are, you know, uh, um, um, what does that sister say in Canada? Broken machines. I keep forgetting her name, but, but that we've become like the broken machinery. Like, how do we come be more broken and more effective in breaking up the function of what's happening here? So I so I just want I'll stop there, but I just if I can I just want to throw out a couple of things I've been taking notes on that I'd love you know so this question of of Afro pessimism, um, this question of fear, I just brought up in my class the other day that from the other side when you're talking about Jonathan I've been stuck lately on Rochelle and like because I have no experience doing what Jonathan did I have some experience being on the other side at 17 sitting in a courtroom maybe wishing somebody mm. rolled up there like Jonathan, <laughs> but then wondering, would I have even, what would I have done? Right. Mm, would I have had the heart to overcome the fear to do what Rochelle did in response to that? Mm. Like I could see just as easily said, I don't want no parts of this. Don't hand me that gun. What you talking about? I might get out of here. <laughs> like I might get off. Like, so like that part, you know, but anyway, so that, the, the, what you said earlier about critical war studies, critical military studies, uh, uh, this unnameable war, 
Um, I put on my moniker the Gorilla Academic because in the chapter you were, you define my actual experience of needing mm. to raise money to get l- legal assistance to fight the, this university that's trying to crush me to this day. Um, so like I, now I feel like I can officially call myself a Gorilla Academic. You all gave me that definition. Thank you very much. Uh, graveyard affirmations captive maternalist function. I mean, just a lot of dope. I, I've really been enjoying it. So so I'll stop there. I just wanted to throw that little bit out and thank you. Yeah, much. I want to add to this because it was on my list of questions. Because Joy, you have like a tension between the function of leadership and then what I wrote like as vanguardism. Mm-hmm. So I wonder where you lie because you have this ongoing like decades long critique of how leadership as a managerial um, like thing Ver- versus like where does the vanguard fit in for you especially after this we're we're not leaderless we're leaderful and like the whole like horizontal you know the pat the conversation for the past 10 years has been some kind of reactionary response to maybe the hyper hierarchy of militant formations in the 70s but now we see that leaderless or leaderful might not deliver but does a vanguard either and it's kind of jumping off of this question but so i'm i'm wondering um I had a question about how you understand leadership, vanguard versus like mass or popular front. Okay. Um, Yeah, Kalanji, you were gonna say something too? Oh yeah, no, I I was just um, responding to Jared. Basically, when I'm talking about um, uh, matching, I'm not saying that we should you all hear me? I'm not saying we should go get gold chains and rims and all that type stuff. I'm saying that simply we have to we don't have to be dusty. We don't have to act like, you know, we, we have to uh, have this. Uh, um, this image of being broken, you know, we can advance still. And when it comes to organizing, indeed, you know, as an organizer, you know, we have our cadre. But at the same time, you have to continue to advance. You have to continue. You need more people. You need more momentum. We'll die off. This has happened time and time again. So we must recruit. If we don't recruit, then eventually we will become encapsulated and 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 and, and broken, and we'll keep on this uh, this this cycle. That's just how I see it, uh, coming from an organizational perspective. You know, so never am I saying that. You know, oh, we should be like the capitalists. No, I'm saying to you, whatever we have to do to gain the attention, there there are folks out here right now. There's a revolutionary being born every day. P.T. Barnum said a sucker's born every minute. I say a revolutionary freedom fighter is being born every day. The conditions of capitalism, the conditions of imperialism, just how they roll will force you into a corner enough that eventually you might jump out and fight. They say people were born come through this in one of three ways inspiration aspiration or desperation unfortunately for the most part we've been desperate people so we have to inspire we have to say okay boom me being on this platform with you all right now i come from a certain space okay so there's folks that's going to check this out and they feel like you know what well man i you know you all broke it down in a different way because sometimes we have a language barrier as well we utilize certain terms we 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 get uh we grow accustomed to speaking the king's language right so we have to like malcolm said speak the language of the people themselves so that's all i'm saying when i'm talking about uh meeting and matching yeah i think um yeah i'm trying to think what i think uh i spent part of the weekend past weekend with a young black person actually several of them. And like when we walked into a restaurant, you know, heads would turn. And so I was trying to understand um, the glamour, if you will. And they explained to me later, they're in their 20s, right? And we were talking about organizing um, how to address District 79 in New York City, which is the school district for, you know, the kids in Rikers. So, I mean, I, I find the DOE to be problematic on many accounts in terms of delivering any form of intellectual or emotional care. But anyway, so we were debating, we were trying to figure out what could be an intervention if we had some resources to work with different populations of youth, right? But then later, like after we finished lunch, you know, they broke down to me, 
what glamour was because I didn't quite get it, right? Because I don't do it. But they said it was a war strategy. And then that made me think that there are multiple war strategies. Would that That's not my war strategy, obviously, you can tell. But there are different war strategies to cope with the culture, to engage in defense, and also a form of offense. Because I noticed, like, when we went into another store area and then, you know, there were middle-class whites, whatever, they resented the fact that the youth were so confident. And actually, it reminds me of, um, we have something in the chat that we'll come to in just a second. I just want to finish this. Um, it reminds me of, of the Panthers who had their contradictions. But the way in which they presented their uniform as a visual, right? Like the way in which the icon was the cat itself, what that's, that stood for. I mean, we're, we're people of imagination of signs and symbols and material struggle, right? And all that is weaven, woven into culture. So we started off, you know, an hour and a half ago talking about culture. And I, I think we can appeal to ourselves, our better selves, our devotional selves, our rebel selves, ourselves that are willing to engage in agape, which is love as political will. It's not you know, romantic love or familial love or love for your kids or love for stuff. It's your willingness to sacrifice, not because you want to, but because of the politics becomes a form of spirituality itself, if it's liberatory. So, I mean, what is a vanguard? I don't, I don't know. I try not to roll with them because I did at one point. Like I knew, you know, rolled with all the elites and stuff. It didn't work for me because I didn't find it to be honest. And it was so alienated, you know, echoing what Kalanji said. It was so alienated from the base. I mean, I know where I teach and I know my isolation is real. And so is my alienation. But I know enough to know that I am alienated. The problem with vanguards is sometimes they don't understand that they're alienated, right? And so I trust people who work in the community, who have bridges into the community, and to go back to what Jared says, and who take intellectual risk to challenge their own z operational zone, known as the academy, you know, to call people out on these different levels or metrics. So I don't know if that answers any of your questions, but I know we have two um, things in the chat, so I don't want to talk too much. So does anybody want to read that, Jared or Kalanji? Um, well, the first one, um, I'm not sure violence targeting, I'm not sure what violence targeting children is a mechanism for community control, mass des desperate deportations, maybe underworld our, I'm not really sure what, the, what is being said there. I'm, I'm sorry. I'm confused okay. by that one. Maybe they um, get clarified when we go to the second one. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, the second one, uh, essentially is asking would, would, that they would love to see an extended series of discussions led by you and your guests focused on the topics of today's discussions. Um, so I, I might suggest that they just stay tuned and continue to <laughs> watch. But. Yeah, I would, I would say um, we. I've been in touch with, and Felicia, I think I forwarded to you. Um, I was also going to invite Kadisha. So again, here's the book. Um, there's a thing called Night Bar School in the South, and they work with um, a group that works with incarcerated women in North Carolina. So we were going to uh, do a free class, meaning that people pay or donate what they can afford, but all the proceeds would go to purchasing books for incarcerated women. And then again, um, I've been in conversation with millennials are killing capitalism because they were gonna crowdsource and they're also in this tax. So there's, there is a concern that, you know, to the extent that our conversations are useful or what we collectively produce, you know, that we can share with people inside as well. Of course, we need to get them outside. But sometimes, even if it doesn't feel like enough, what we offer is some form of sustenance. 
I mean, for me, sometimes it's just about like, just keep people, let them hang on long enough to return a corner or get the resources, deliver the food, get the kids out of foster care, send money in for commissaries, you know, hire attorneys to get people out, protest the state. I, you know, what was the Panthers said, uh, survival pending revolution, revolution or liberty. Yeah. And I'm, and I don't always have to keep quoting them. Right. Cause it's a, it's what you know from just keeping your family members alive. Right. Or Jarrett, your pet happy and going to sleep at night. So other people can sleep at the household or other beings. Um, so I don't know if I was answering the, the questions that y'all put out, but yeah, yeah I, I, the the first one, admittedly, I'm not clear what's being asked. Uh, something about violence targeting children is a mechanism of community control, and I think they're saying mass deportations uh, in the okay. underworld of our our dead. Um, but I'm not clear about that last part there. Well, one thing I could say in terms of so this is what we're able to do with the grant um, organizing the academy on February 8th from 6 to 8 p.m. There's a conversation with Samaria Rice the mother of the murdered 12-year-old Tamir Rice, Don Wooten, who was a whistleblower in terms of forced hysterectomies in ICE camps. And I think I've mentioned before, at least in Texas, disproportionately those targeted for violence would have been um, Haitians, Africans, people from Cameroon, right? So even though everybody's held captive, anti-Blackness is on steroids inside all zones of captivity. Um, also, Joyce McMillan, who's in Harlem, who organizes for the abolishment of foster care, disproportionately Black children removed from their families, even though there's no data at all, because it's not true, that we are more dysfunctional than other families. But again, if it's a Black child, you're more, you know, to, you're, you're going to be hyper-targeted by the cops, by social workers, by teachers, by principals, we go down the list. And the last person is Amanda Wallace, who's in North Carolina, who was a social worker and then realized when they looked at the data and all these forced removals of black children as a black person, um, that this was corrupt and they quit their job. But then they protested against a black judge woman, it's kind of like Mumia's case, a black woman judge who was just like signing all kinds of paperwork for um, trafficking, I'll call it that, trafficking people's babies and their kids. And when she protested at the house, the police came. And then again, that terrorist tag um, was going to be, you know, leveled against um, Amanda Wall. So those four Black intellectuals, Black fighters, Black rebels will be in dialogue at 6 p.m. February 8th. You can go to Williams College if you want to see the link. So I think there's so many different ways in which we understand um, maternity. But again, the captive maternal is a non-gendered construct. And it can be agendered, male, female, queer, whatever. It's your function as a caretaker. And like everybody on this call cares for and nurtures other people, it's not, I mean, there's no gender identity that determines our political will or our level of devotion. So I really appreciate, Felicia, you putting devotion on the table. Devotion doesn't belong to any particular gender, okay? And the willingness to sacrifice, to stabilize, to build, and also to protect I see ourselves as war resistors. That's the highest stage of the captive maternal. There are about four or five stages. You know, the first level, you're conflicted, caretaking. And then there's a comprador. Like Condoleezza Rice is not a captive maternal. Anybody who willingly works for empire isn't in another category. That's not the zone of devotion or care. But the war resistor is an inevitable formation if you continue to move forward because the state comes from all forms of maranage, just like the master hunts, you know, bounty folks to find the escapees, right? And again, when Rochelle is a co-defendant with Davis, they have two different arguments for Davis right? And I'm, you know, I'm glad that 
they they that this one worked for them. As a citizen, they had a right to protection under the law. For Rochelle McGee, as a slave, they had a right to fugitivity. Rochelle was in the war. That is the war zone. That is when it's actualized. Like, you know what this is. 13th Amendment codifies it. The predatory policing inside of prisons in the terror does what the master likes in the state pretending that they're not doing it, but the state is paying everybody to terrorize. And we're paying the taxes that allows the state to pay for terror, right? And so these contradictions, you know, I'm going to echo what's already been said. They can be addressed by intellectualism, but they're also addressed by the heart because I don't believe our mental capacity could deal with this without a spiritual template, even if it's just rooted in the love of family. I think we would just have serial breakdowns continuously, unless we had something that was transcendent. And I, I want to go back to what Felicia said, because I mean, like Felicia, that was my next project. I was, but then I was afraid I'd become depressed and an alcoholic. So I was simply going to study every clandestine, well, you know, President Johnson sending mercenaries in in the 60s to take out freedom fighters in Africa to stabilize the apartheid regime. You know, I was I was just going to like, OK, let me try to anticipate the curve because I know you all have a curve and because you just you consume us and then you bump yourself up to the next level and then you sell our struggle back to us as simulacra. So what I want to do is I want to study the intellect for empire and predatory violence. I want to study the terrorists, but then it's like, I need to balance that off with something. Or, you know, if I'm going to do it as an individual, it's probably not healthy, but if we do it as collective. So when we move to, you know, four weeks of blood in my eye, and maybe Felicia, you know, you can come back or write in the comments or chat, whatever we're doing here. I just think we need each other. And for me, that would be the harder spirituality if we can agree that our ties to each other will be disciplined by devotion and not by just rapacious desire to be held and comforted, which you have a right to be, but that doesn't really work in a war. I mean, at some point, you just have to be emotionally stable enough to be productive. And then that becomes a form of comfort because you see your agency in love and in physical practice on the ground. Yes, yes. Right on. Yeah, uh, I think we had one more question that uh, um, Janine dropped in the chat here. Some Afro-pessimists may believe that we absolutely have the capacity to win battles, as y'all know, but may, many seem unclear about. They may organize and participate in such wins as part of their political practice and political devotion. But what is to be said about black people's capacity to win the war, which seems to never be won, and whose perpetual losing has become a weapon of containment? Here, it is a question of the capacity to win the war against empire as opposed to winning battles. Before you all answer that, can you, can you please, uh, for folks who are just tuning in, and for mm -hmm. some of our folks who are not familiar with that particular term, can you define Afro-pessimism? Because, I, again, I think that one of the things that we must do is we should always uh, approach this as if uh, folks are uh, new to 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 movement, circles, uh, culture, et cetera. Yeah, right on. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Do, uh, Felicia, you want to start and then I'll just um, back up. I'll come second on the AP. You're on mute. Are you on mute? Yeah, I think she muted her. Herself. I'm muted. Felicia, you're muted. Uh, I can't unmute you. There you go. Sorry. There you go. All right. I don't want to do them injustice because um, I don't think I'm as studied as I should be. But the things I've taken away are that um, the figure of the slave um, or the, the slave the enslaved are, that is a kind of enduring and um, 
it's an enduring, it's wedded to blackness that you cannot separate the two. And so perhaps thinking about the black condition from the position of the slave um, in an ahistorical way. So throughout time, despite, you know, structural arrangements, that ontological, so that being, that matter of like not you know, class, re not relation or kind of these other ways we organize social or political communities, but this matter of black being, a kind of essence of, of blackness is, I think what they say, coterminous with the slave. Um, and so what this framework then allows you to do is to maybe um, slow down. This is what it's helped me do. Cause I'm also like, I don't work through the paradigm um, from my work, but it has taught me to be a lot more precise uh, if I'm going to posit a kind of structural change in the black condition anywhere to do so with greater precision and not out of the desire to see progress, um, but rather to make an argument that can prove one has actually moved out of the status of the of of enslavement. And so I think critiques of that are that you know um, this, the slave isn't just this one category that moves through time. That there are meaningful changes. I mean, there's like a lot of debate. But what it's attuned me to is that. Um, while slavery is that structuring condition that you cannot run away from because you fear it, because you fear what it would say about your positionality. Um, and then terror, the degree of terror and the desire for terror um, that fuels this whole project. It's more than just an instrumental dispossession. There's pleasure. Um, and it has that psychoanalytic dimension of like, what is the role of pleasure in maintaining these relations and how, so not just the state. And this is also where I think I um, learn a lot, it's civil society. So the Afro-pessimist arrangement thinks about civil society and the state as equally captive. I right, think right. about the master, cause I'm really, it's like, he just got lost. Like all of a sudden there are no more masters as if that dimension of power didn't reproduce itself. They're really focused on civil society. So take away, government take away these like federal capacities and you're still left with the same kinds of predation why is that and what does like civil society needs our death it needs our for its own regeneration i think those are some of the like operating terms um and it's a lot of pressure to not um, do convenient mind games with what we imagine has happened with what we have achieved I think they really direct you to be precise about the function, like what change, what historical change actually is, as opposed to assuming it, which we often do, like progress, progress, progress. Um, so it's told me to sit back and theorize like more robustly when something has, when I imagine something has structurally shifted, like enslavement to Jim Crow. What what exactly is the nature of that shift? And am I assuming things that I desire to see as opposed to like the structural continuities? Um, I don't know. I and, then, and then ontological is like that really like the basis. It's not like a political relationship. There's, it exists at a different, I think as Wilderson says, order of abstraction. Um, but yeah, I don't want to yeah. do them disservice. So yeah. yeah, I would add to, I mean, not being one, you know, but knowing them or reading them. So also there's a, a clip on YouTube, The Ontology of Betrayal, which graduate students conceived of, Rebecca Ann Wilcox, T. Trotman, and Tasia Mars McDougall, I believe, right? Um, which if you're interested, you know, you could check in. It's Frank Wilderson and Selma Terefe, right? And myself talking. So part of their um, analysis comes from Orlando Patterson, the Harvard sociologist, his book is Slavery and Social Death. And his politics are different. I don't think he is a he is a radical thinker or organizer. And the architects of, of AP or Afro-pessimism, like Frank fought in the underground in South Africa. And that's it was Frank who taught me the distinction between Chris Haney and Nelson Mandela. And then once I got it, you know, I couldn't drop it. So, you know, the, the zone of betrayal, of course, is, is not just the exterior war of white overlords. It's also black people who work with IMF or who want to stop 
a revolution or, you know, because it's time for compromise negotiation. And it's, it's a complicated story. You guys can do more research or talk about that. But the things that were key for me is like if Chris Honey is gunned down in his driveway and supposedly only a few people in the ANC knew where he lived or where he would be at that moment, then that the Afrikaners could hire a white mercenary who kills them. And then again, reportedly what I know could be wrong, check your facts, that this white mercenary mysteriously dies before he goes on trial and can say who told them where Hani's house was, right? That this becomes the complexity of our struggle because I know the longer, longer question is Afro-pessimism and how do you win the war? So this is a tangible loss right? The devotion for Hani, I think, shapes Wilderson. So that decades later, when I'm doing one of these anthologies on political prisoners, and I have a piece from Jalil Mutakim, and the piece, it talks about war, and I get timid because my academic colleagues are like, oh, you need to censor, edit down what Jalil writes. And I call Frank on the West Coast, and he's like, print the whole thing. And Jalil is like, do what you want. Like, I'm not going to try to please you, and I can't. I'm inside, right? But then I was like, okay, we're going to print the whole thing. So there are ways in which Afro-pessimism gives you the support to do what you're supposed to do. I wouldn't say that it is the complete um, matrix or a complete paradigm for devotion and struggle. But through Afro-pessimism, I started to distinguish anti-Blackness from white supremacy anti-blackness from racism, that those concepts of racism and white supremacy couldn't really deliver, you know, or explain what Felicia and all of us have been talking about for the last two hours. The specificity of violence that the master arrays against us is tied to chattel slavery and the legitimization of chattel slavery is tied to blackness and to the African. So sometimes Wilderson says, it goes back to, thir you know, 1300 years. And then I think about um, when the Moors, the Muslims, like Africans, came over and took over Spain and Portugal, and they brought a lot, like, like civilization in the short term. But the resentment of the Moor, you know, you track it through, you know, Shakespeare, Othello, right? This template of the Black, once they're defeated in 1492 in January by the Spaniards, Isabella and Ferdinand, whatever, the royalty. In August is when Christopher Columbus gets his money to go, quote, find the new world and start sparking genocides, right? And the later the capture of Africans once they decimate indigenous populations. And I know, Felicia, you do this work around black indigeneity, right? Coming from Sylvia Winter. And so we have to talk about that later in the book that you're working on with Tony Bodes and um, Allegra. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So the I learned from AP. I'm not sure I agree with them because and I think I'm going back again, my gratitude with devotion. I think that I want to be disciplined by devotion. I think they think more in psychoanalytic terms, but they have gifts to offer in terms of winning a war. I've I don't even know if that's possible, like to win a war, like win a war in a definitive way that the opposition doesn't come back. I mean, it is permanent war. And I think that's the hardest thing. Like you wanna win a war, we have a parade. I mean, that was like Obama in 2008. We won against this white supremacy because we got a black president who also turned out to be an imperialist. Like our wins, are not exactly what they think or we think they might be. And so we have to be remain constantly vigilant and always mobilized. And if you're always mobilized, then you know that these winds have to be protected. And so the wars never end because the aggressors never stop. So that's my take on it. Yeah, well. I would just add maybe that one of my chapters, I kind of divide it into these Di they're not dichotomies, they're binaries because they're not antithetical. Master and state, they're in relation, then earth and world and body and consciousness. But for earth and world, the, you know, abstracting earth into submission, and I try to look at the mm -hmm. history of cartography in the 1400s 
um, Africa is so central to developing a concept of open Euclidean space, just open space. It used to be theological space, like space granted by God and um, the way the ecumen is what they called the Christian kind of unit was organized. Everything else was hellfire, water, until they breach Africa. And Africa allows them to open an imagination for open space. And it primes the new, it is the new world. Africa, and the breach of Africa is a new world that we slip out of the North American new world. And this is all to say that the submission of earth is deeply tied to anti-Blackness administratively from conceiving the globe as an open global conquerable space to all the other things they've done to produce this level of ecocide. And so I think our battle has been so sutured to earth now that it really is earth versus world. And until earth is liberated, I, I, that's how deeply I think anti-Blackness exists at all dimensions, that it's geological, it's environmental, of course, as we know. But um, I guess in winning the war, there's something about earth to me, earth versus world. They want world to be synonymous with earth. They want to be this thing that they created to be the terrestrial like fact. And it's simply not. It's overlaid and they've, they've divided and desecrated and manipulated earth's surface and terrain, it, all of it, and they've punctured it. So I guess in winning the war, I, un, I think unfortunately we've been backed into a corner and this is why I'm saying the more time that goes by, it's not like it's this benign and non-mutative force. It, it gets more powerful. Are we getting more powerful is the question. It gets more powerful to the point now where I think like our, we as black people are fundamentally sutured to earth in a way. And I don't know what it means to liberate earth, but that's kind of how in that chapter, earth world or this dynamic, how I wanna take earth back from them. But that also means that the scale of this problem is it's terrestrial in a way that is unique to us as the cradle of life, literally in an evolutionary sense, throwing seeds and, and food and be, like all of that beginning, like that's not accidental to me that the beginning is the thing that they, the crushing the beginning is the thing they constantly reenact. To me, there's some kind of like existential thing there, but I don't know. So it's to say, I think we are so wedded to ecocide. Um, we've, we've been turned into nature in a number of ways, but, and I think there's a lot, a lot of work on that, but I don't know. I think it's a matter of earth versus world. That's how deep it is. And I don't think we can, we have to start maybe thinking on that scale, which is, I think to the Afro-pessimist point might exceed our capacity. That's what I like about, and I'm glad Janine's bringing this up, like capacity. It's that psychic, when sometimes when you sit and you think about the magnitude of what was done, the, 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 how disgusting, brutal, and administrative and bureaucratic it was, that conjunction, the administration and the abstraction of filth, I mean, mm -hmm. that is psychically overwhelming. I have points where it does incapacitate me because when you really stare at that beast in the eyes, it is overwhelming. And there's a psychic thing that goes on. Um, so that's another thing I pull from them is like to honor just how split, like Wanda Coleman, my favorite poet, you know, says, I have a split psyche. My psyche is shattered. And she writes from that shattering. And that's why she's like, um, so that is something to keep in mind too. But, and that goes to Bob Marley, like mental slavery. Thank right. you. I mean, I know we have to go, but this has been wonderful. And for the people who wrote in the ch your questions and comments, so sorry we didn't get to them, but please keep commenting and we'll try to pick up. Um, Natality you brought to the table and our capacity to rebirth ourselves and the world is endless and to defend ourselves in, from predatory um, states, masters, formations as well. So thank you so much for joining us. And I know Kalanji, did you want to wrap it? Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, Felicia, this was a awesome convo. Definitely appreciate you coming on. Um, I say we draft you as a co-host, but that's just me. You know what I'm saying? It's good yeah. to have good good to have the energy. Um and, and, and I love the balance because I think that um you know, we, we often talk about when we're talking about war, it's either uh, physical or mental. And so many folks leave the spiritual aspect out of it. And when you talk about earth versus, versus world, 
we can guarantee that there will be a war bigger than us. And I think that right now, uh, these folks are, are helping to push it along. And, 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 you know, the term beast is an understatement, but, you know, with a beast of this magnitude of this nature, it requires extermination. And I think that there are certain words that we like to shy away from and we don't want to use because, you know, it, it sounds like, you know, well, that sounds bad. I mean, but they do to us what we are afraid to think about being done to them. You understand what I'm saying? It's like our fear is so deeply embedded that we don't even want to think about how to properly respond. You know, which is which is sad. Oh, is okay, so sorry. So I, I the word just came to mind is we have to come back and talk about cyborgs then, because the level of technology that's interfacing with the human has altered the human, the so-called human, and we're supposed to not be there. But okay, so yeah, um, and more to discuss. Janine Jones, thank you so much for helping with. Crafting, yes. shaping, and the queries again. Our apologies, but yeah, more continued discussion and more. Maybe we we will focus a lot when we do blood and eye and my eye or our eyes. So yes. please look forward to the four part, you know, yeah. and the link to the book itself, and and yeah. we'll pick up where Kalanji left off. Yeah. So look, look inside of the uh, for folks who are checking us out online. Look inside of the uh, description. Uh, get your books, Blood in My Eye. As uh, Joy mentioned, we will start on uh, the 20th, February 20th, which would be the um, the day before the assassination of El Hajj Malik Shabazz, Malcolm X. Uh, on the 20th, we'll have Zach Kondo, who is a um, who is one of the foremost uh, authorities in regards to uh, the life and assassination of um Malcolm, I know that next week, who do we have on board next week, uh, Joy? Max mm. Parthas, uh, leading abolitionist against the 13th Amendment. So the master is tied to the state. Um, thank you for the language, um, Felicia, in terms of their form of abolition. They're, they've gone from state to state to get individual states to um, nullify or throw out the 13th Amendment that legalizes slavery if you've been convicted of a uh, crime. And Louisiana said, no, we want to keep slavery in the states, but other states have like rejected. I think there's about 11 so far um, who are, you know, not willing to pay people to be firefighters or whatever for 27 cents an hour or 60 cents or whatever the exploitation rate, which is actually slavery rate is going on now. Right on. We'll be back next week. Guerrilla Intellectual University. Make sure you share this, subscribe, like it. That's all the cool things they say in YouTube world. Um, also, if you do not mind, leave us a comment in the comment section. I, I think I kind of like it this way without the uh, without chat on this particular um, piece on, on, on GIU, because I think that um, it, it allows us to focus a little more on what's going on That's so intense. definitely you guys wrote some really challenging and insightful yeah. queries and please keep doing that i mean and we'll figure yeah, out so. a rhythm where we can incorporate as many mm -hmm. but yeah you bumped it up so thank you to everybody who wrote in you bumped it up to another level yes thank you very much felicia we'll see you next time um Stay on this you all be safe all ready right. for revolution giu thank you thank you so much yes Am I the I'm still here. Are you here, Joy? Oh, wait.